Tips by H.G. Wells, dramatised by Michelin Wanda, music by Alona Sekhan, with Mark Straker as Kips, Nicholas Grace as Chitolo, Catherine Helbert as Helen, and Paul Damon as H.G. Wells, the storyteller. <laughs> Episode 1, The Making of Kips. Until he was nearly arrived at manhood, it did not become clear to Arthur Kipps how it was that he had come into the care of an aunt and uncle instead of having a father and mother like other little boys. He had a vague feeling that a certain wistful face that looked out at him from a plush and gilt picture frame was the face of his mother. He knew that she had provided for him to be sent to a certain rather smart school in Hastings, and he vaguely thought that perhaps she was dead. And that was why his uncle and aunt never spoke of her. But, like many boys, concerned only with the moment, he did not worry about what he did not know. Meanwhile, his aunt and uncle were the immediate gods of his world, with arbitrary injunctions and high, if sometimes inscrutable, standards. Can I have more pie, aunt? When you've finished what's on your plate. Right. Drat and drab it. What on earth is that noise for? Don't gobble up. It's not me. Oh, and don't talk with your mouth, fool. Bonkers. You heard your uncle. Now hold your knife proper. Or I'll wrap your knuckles. You don't want that, do you? No, oh, Aunt. Mind your manners, then. And yet his uncle always finished up his gravy with his knife. Very strange. There were, however, small compensations. His uncle kept a shop which held a mine of treasures. China and stationery, needles and cottons, bathing suits, tents, and even trumpets which he was allowed to hold, but not to blow. I've finished my tea. Can I go to play, please? As long as you ain't going to play with that little Sid Pornick from next door. No. That old Pornick's a blaring jackass. Huh? I swear he waits to beat his mattons in the winds in the right direction to blow the dust right in my shop. Can I go, then? Oh, all right. Go out the back way and you'll avoid the Pornicks. You'll have to say your catechism later, maybe. Oh, that boy. Kipps always thought of his aunt as lean, rather worried-looking, and prone to a certain obliquity of cap. He thought of his uncle as massive, many-chinned, and careless about his buttons. They neither visited nor received visitors, being suspicious of everyone. According to the English ideal, they kept themselves to themselves. Kipps, being of a sociable disposition, could only make friends through the sin of disobedience. Oh, Sir Ponick. Oh, no, Artie Kipps. I brought my sister Anne, and she's brought her doll. Hello, Sid's sister. Hello, Artie. What are you doing, Sid? Watching them goats. Look at them. <laughs> They've gone off scrap. <laughs> Here, that goat looks like you're dead. I don't. You do? You just watch it. Do you know what a blaring jackass is? No. Nah, it's what my uncle called you dead. Did he? That's nasty. Is it? Sounds right to me. You better swallow that or I'll fight you. You couldn't fight me. Oh, I could. We, we won't end top on me back. Couldn't? Could. Could. Oh. Could. Oh. Well then, get your fists up. You keep out of it. Come on. Oh, yeah. You got a black eye. You got one and all. <laughs> My nose is bleeding. <laughs> So's mine. Oh. Who's one then? I don't know. Perhaps we both won. Oh. Yeah, that's it. We both won. I won and you won. Friends. Friends. Shake on it. Right. There you are, <laughs> What do you think of that? I think fighting's really stupid. Oh, oh yeah. Does your doll think fighting's stupid? Of course she does. Well, give her a chance to decide oh, for oh, herself. Oh, leave my doll alone, Sid. <laughs> there. Oh, leave my there. Sid. Leave my doll alone. Look, I only get a black eye Stop that we got. Leave off, Sid. Oh, I'll tell Dad and he'll whack you. Hmm. Will your Dad whack you? Oh, yeah. But I'll put newspaper down my trousers. Really don't hurt at all. <laughs> yeah. I hope you ain't torn my jacket. Let's have a look. No, it's not tall. It's just a bit dirty. Yeah, I'll brush it off. Oh, <laughs> you don't know I've a mess. So do you. Do you want to fight about it? 
Now, I've done enough fighting for now. If we was real soldiers, you know, we'd look a mess all the time. <laughs> Me mum wouldn't like that. Nor my aunt. We'd best not be soldiers then, eh? What are we going to do now then, eh? Let's go down on the beach, play smugglers and wanted men. We can go on that old wreck on the sand. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All this was possible, of course, only during the holidays. During term time, Kipps attended the Cavendish Academy for Young Gentlemen, a middle-class establishment in Hastings, whose principal was a creature of indifferent digestion and temper, and who succeeded in teaching the boys very little indeed, beyond reading aloud from the Bible and learning long passages of obscure poetry. Kipps had to endure dreary walks when the boys marched two by two in dismal, wet weather. The holidays were very different from school. They were free. They were spacious. And though he never knew it in these words, they had an element of beauty. <sighs> Ron's giving me dinner. Cold rice pudding and plums. Oh, yeah, I may. Can I have some? Of course. In the memories of his boyhood, these days shone like strips of stained glass window in a dreary waste of scholastic walls. Hey, what's that kip's done? Oh, it's the original Huron's war cry. How do you know? It's a deadly secret. I'll tell it tonight. I'll pass day, fella, in the lane beyond the church. I'll pass day that is in the lane beyond the church, fella. The trella was considered to render this sentence incomprehensible to the uninitiated. Small boys are so damnably loud. Here, don't swear. Sorry, Kipps. How do you know my name? Who are you? Mr. H.G. Wells, at your service, Master Kipps. Oh, I've seen you before. You've been following me around, haven't you? I'm interested in you. Go off. I know all about you. Oh, yeah? Indeed. Possibly more than you know yourself. Go off. At that moment, there appeared along by the churchyard wall... A girl in a short frock, brown-haired with dark blue eyes. And Pornick, she whose doll Sid had broken. Don't you know that? Never you mind. But you can... Shh! She's going to say something to you. Artie, I, I can't tell you Sid will be late. Father's made him dust all the boxes in the shop. What on earth for? Mm, I don't know. Oh. Sid's left school now, you know. I know. You left school? Just about to. Sid's going to be a sea captain. What are you going to be? What? A uh, sea captain? Look, I can hop. Nice. I can run as well. Can you run? I can run fast. Oh, I can run. I'll run you any day. Right then, run you now. Far is that tree over there. Right, oh, you ready? I'll give you a start. From here. Right then, you ready? Ready. Right. Off. Oh. Oh, what? Ty! What have we got here together? I've got you first. I'll touch the tree first. Oh, you never! You've again, then I don't mind. You don't run bad, you know. Well, I suppose you're giving me a head start. Hello, Sid. Hello. Uh, you better look out, young man. Mother wants you to go home to help with the dishes. No, oh, i better go then. Here, yeah, well, what about the race? I've got to go home. Ta-ta! You ain't been racing her. Oh, it wasn't a proper race. I'll give her a start. Oh, she don't run anyway. She's a girl. As the summer passed, Kipps found himself thinking more and more of Anne. You left school? What are you going to be? He couldn't explain why, but every detail about her face, her hair, her every word remained with him, even when he was engaged in far more important activities such as joining Sid on the old wreck washed up on the beach. Now, hold on, Artie. This ship has been taking provisions to war, and it's got shot at, and it's sinking fast. We're sailors, brave to the end. Your sister ain't a bad sort. I clout her a lot. Oh, yeah, don't it stink rotten? <laughs> <laughs> Must have been the wheat the ship was carrying. Here, watch out, yeah? Pirate, there, on the horizon. Yeah. Yeah, grab this musket. Have at you, you lousy pirates! Bang! 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 Bang!
a shipwreck, floating along without food or water, haggard upon stagnant ocean. Isn't it nice having sisters? No, I ain't. Why well, not? I mean, they know too much. They get out of doing things. Sisters is rot. That's what sisters is. Girls, if you like. But sisters, nah. But ain't sisters girls? No. Well, of course, I didn't mean... Well, I wasn't exactly thinking... So you've got a girl? Well, sort of. Well, well not... I've got a girl. No. I have. Bet you don't know who she is. Who is it then? Ah, Tell us. Secret. Secret. Dying solemn. Dying solemn. I swear by Neptune. I swear by Neptune. It begins with a... Nem. Yeah? Maud. Charis. Get that! Oh, she ain't your girl Sipony. Yeah. She's the vicar's daughter. She is? True, true. But she's got a bicycle. Cross my heart and hope to die. Will? Does she know she's your girl? I'd die for that girl, Art Kipps. If she was to ask me to chuck myself in this sea for her, I would. Will? I read this book, see. It's a love story. Now, there's a chap in it, just like me, hmm? a baronet. He is a person of volcanic passions concealed beneath a demeanour of icy cynicism. Have you noticed how I have a habit of gritting my teeth? Can't I have? Well, I have. And it's so does he. I'd like to have a girl. Just to talk to her, Matt. Yeah, I'm getting angry. Got any rice pudding, Matt? No, we finished it all. Oh, I'm off my tea. What about us being shipwrecked? We've been rescued. Can. As he and Sid walked home, Kip thought how he would like to live happily in a wrecked ship with Anne, and run races, and eat chocolates and fried sprats. See you later, Artie. Bye. As Kipps passed the church, there was Anne herself, her hair dark against the vast masses of flaming crimson flowers. Kipps stopped with a resolute shyness. Hello, Anne. Hello, Art Kipps. I've been thinking. I like you, Anne. I like you, Artie. I wish you was my girl, Anne. I say, will you be my girl? Would you like to be my girl? Well, yeah, all right. If you like, Artie. All right, then. Then you are. All right, then. What are you going to do now you left school? Oh, I'm going to be apprenticed to a draper in Folkestone. When? Next week. Oh. I've got new trousers and a black coat and four new shirts. Anne, I've got this idea. I read in the magazine, tidbits, actually, that lovers give each other tokens. What's a token? Well, you take something and divide it in two. Like you might take sixpence and break it in two. Well, why should you do that? It's no good if it's broke. Well, you divide it in two and then you keep one bit each. Well, that's what a token is. Look, I've got a sixpence here. I'll show you. I'll use my knife. Oh! Careful! Oh, damn your finger. Oh, it's no good. See, the idea is I have half and you have half. And when we're separated, you look at yours and I look at mine. And we think of each other. Tell you what, I know when your father keeps a file. Well, I can have a go at it. I'll easily do it. All right, there you are. Ah. Anne, I do love you, really. I'll do anything for you, and I'll... What? And I wish you let me... Can I kiss you? Don't be silly, Artie. Oh, kid. come on. <laughs> no, it's silly. But what good do you be, my girl, if I can't kiss you? <laughs> it's silly. I don't want to. Well, we might as well go home then. Suits me. Right then. Goodbye, Anne. See you, Artie. I do love you, Anne Pawnee. <laughs> altogether inaccessible. Kip saw her on Sunday, but she pretended not to see him, because her mother was with her. As the days went by, he began to believe she had given him up forever. He became feverishly anxious to see her, but still she was hidden. Then came the day he was to leave for Folkestone, in his new suit and bowler. With his uncle and aunt, he went to board the horse bus. He was desperate at the thought he might not see Anne again. That's your sandwiches, Art. Oh, 
Look after yourself. Bye, lad. See you do as you're told. Right then, all aboard. We're off. Goodbye, Uncle. On. Hey! Oh. Wait a minute! Oh, dear! I've got... Oh. I've got me! Hey, driver, hold on for a tick. Just a tick. You got your head, lad? Yes, no, oh, just a tick. I will. Don't forget me, Anne. Right then, off we go. Get up now. When Kipps left New Romney, he was 14. Thin, with smallish features, and eyes that were sometimes dark and sometimes very light. He was by nature confused in his mind and repeating in his manners. Inexorable fate had appointed him to serve his country in commerce. Dear, what you going on about? You being apprenticed to a draper. Why didn't you just say so? Why do you use all them long words? It's my style. Are you still going to be following me around? I expect so. I shan't get in your way. Two yards of white camera. Forty-five hooks and eyes. No trouble, I assure you. Five yards of butter button. What can I have the pleasure? Your change, madam. No trouble, I assure you. The indentures that bound Kipps to Mr. Shulford of Folkestone were antique and complex. They forbade Kipps to dice and game. They made him over, body and soul, for seven long years to his new employer, Mr. Shulford. In return for which, Mr. Kipps, I shall teach you the old heart and mystery of the drapery trade. Thank you, Mr. Shulford, sir. We expect you to work, you know, and we expect you to study our interests. Our system here is the best system you could have. I made it, and I ought to know. I began at the very bottom of the ladder when I was 14, and there isn't a step in it I don't know. Now, this is Mr. Carshot. He will give you the cards of rules and pines. Oh, I don't like it, sir. Uh, you're to do whatever Mr. Carshot tells you. Here's a blotting pad and ink pot for you to carry. Oh, don't fumble. Come along, come along now. Gloves and ribbons, baby linens here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ah, this is Buggins. I keep, sir. You're to do whatever Mr. Buggins tells you. <laughs> See, don't fumble, Buggins. Sir. Now, here is the overhead change carrier. I can tell you exactly how many minutes per year are saved by this change carrier. Pounds, you take my word for it. System, system and efficiency. Efficiency and system. Yes. <laughs> now, this here's the door to the yard, locked after 10.30 by order. Edwin Shalford. See? <laughs> Says so on that sign there. Mr. Shalford always wrote by order, though it conveyed no earthly meaning to him. He was one of those people who collect technicalities upon them as a bug collects dirt. He was an irascible, energetic little man with hairy hands, for the most part under his coattails, a long, shiny, bald head and a neatly trimmed beard. He walked lightly and with a confident jerk, and he was given to humming. His establishment was now one of the most considerable in Folkestone, and this despite, perhaps because of, a very strange and peculiar use of the English language, which he believed was essential to business efficiency. Can you write out hodder skips? Oh, I don't know, Mr. Shulford. Well, look here. For example, I've written one piece, lin pot black alas. What do I mean by that, eh? Oh, I don't know, sir. And then two each silk net as per pats herewith. I don't know, sir. Ah, oh, get there. Pity you couldn't get some more commercial education at your school. Instead of all this literary stuff. Oh, uh, well, my boy, if you're not a bit sharper, you'll never learn to write orders proper. For now, you best stick stamps and all them letters, and mind you stick them the right way up. Yes, sir. And try and profit a little more by the opportunities your aunt and uncle have provided. Can't see what'll happen to you if you don't. Yes, sir. Now, lick the envelope, lick the envelope, <laughs> like this, see? <laughs> it's the little things that mount up. That's how you learn. <laughs> 
Mr. Shelford set himself assiduously to get as much out of Kipps and to put as little into him as he could. What he put into Kipps was chiefly bread and margarine, infusions of tea and chicory dust, colonial meat by contract at threepence a pound, potatoes by the sack and watered beer. Repeat half to me. What can I have the pleasure of? What can I have the pleasure? No trouble, I assure you. No trouble, I assure you. Mm -hmm. uh, you shall learn to block and fold and measure material of all sorts. And to lift your hat from your head when you pass me in the street. In return for these benefits, he worked so that he commonly went to bed exhausted and footsore. And at half past six in the morning, he would descend, unwashed, in old clothes and a scarf, to dust boxes, take down wrappers and clean windows till eight. Kips, shift these boxes for me. Roll that cretin up, Kips. It seems to have a mind of its own, Mr. Buggins. Oh, my heart and liver. Oh. i never seen such a boy. Now then, Kips, look lively. Hold up them curtains. They're very heavy, Mr. Carlson. Oh, of course they're heavy. Oh, my heart and liver. Rarely much later than nine at night, a supper of bread and cheese awaited him, and that consumed, the rest of the day was entirely at his disposal for reading, recreation, and the improvement of his mind. Oh, tired. Good night, Buggins. Good night. Good night. My art liver. Come along, Kips. And you'll stop taking. Hurry up, Kips. Bring the ticket to me, Pot. You'll make my two take, Kips. You've got no more sniff to me you than a bad potato. Just let down him. Try your foot, sir. By my. Then, I've kicked it over. Why can't you hold it till I need it? Because I'm holding the ticket, sir. I don't know. No more system than a bad potato. Oh, dear. Here, Artie, take it. I done it this morning. The sixpence. When you get too old to work, they chuck you away. Can't a draper get a shop of his own? How's a draper shopman to save up the capital of five hundred pounds? It can't be done. We're in a blessed drain pipe and we've got to crawl along it till we die. I'd like to hit that beggar oh. shelf and slap in the face and see how his blessed oh. system met that. No. 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 Oh. Oh. oh, my feet are that sore. If I could stay here till my day's end, no adventures, no glory, no change, no freedom. What are you going to do about it, Kipps? Oh, run away to sea, Mr. Wells. Oh, yes. I'll set fire to the Emporium. I'll drown myself. No, you won't. Not you. Well, here, what time is it? Oh, Lord, I'll be late putting the shutters up. It's all your fault keeping me here chatting. And Kipps consoled himself with the thought that it would soon be Christmas, and he would be home and see Anne. And by hook or by crook, he would kiss her. Then everything would be perfect, and he would be perfectly happy. But Anne, too, had happened on evil things. More tea, Artie. Tom, and another bit of steak and kidney, please. Help yourself, dear. Tom, then I think I'll go for a walk. Uh, visit an old friend. Old Sid, maybe. Oh, they've cleared out the pornics. Mm. Good riddance to bad rubbish, I say. <laughs> Cleared out? Yeah, Sid's gone off with errand boy somewhere to one of these here blasted new cycle shops. Mm. Has he? And what about his sister, Anne? She's gone herself to somewhere in Ashton. Help. Slavey, more like. Why do they didn't say ladies' help while they was about it? I see. Ain't you going to finish your pie, Archie? No, I ain't as hungry as I thought. You happy at Shelford, then? Oh, it's all right. I don't see much prospects. There's times, aren't when I think of giving it up. But you can't do that, Uncle. Do you want the pornics to say you ain't good enough to be a draper? Oh, no, Uncle, I suppose not. <laughs> Kipps cleaned windows no longer. He was serving customers and taking goods out on approval. Presently, he was third apprentice, and his moustache began to be visible. <coughs> Mr. Kipps, I do believe you need some sartorial help. What's that when it's at home, Mr. Carshaw? I suggest you go to a tailor and replace your shorning coat and tails. Should I? Well, and get some stand-up collars? Like yours? You'll see, Mr. Kipps, how the young ladies will notice you. Oh, go away. I mean it. Look, 
Flower bait, the cash guy, is looking at you very hard. My, Mr. Kent. My, you do look smart. See? What a nice boy you are. I never noticed till now. Do you think so, Miss Bates? Kipps, what? It is painful to me to see how your fidelity to Anne's memory fails at the first onset of admiration from another young lady. Go away, you. Did you say something, Mr. Kipps? I, I was just thinking out loud. Looking forward to Sunday. Yeah. Well, now, would you like to go for a walk with me on Sunday, then? Would I? Well, I don't mind if I do. Oh, I can see you're a gentleman. I hope you've got some gloves. A gentleman should wear or at least carry gloves. And you know that a gentleman always walks outside a lady on the pavement? Oh, yes. Yes. I know all that. Kipps took to these new interests with a quite natural zeal. Before two years were out, he had been engaged six times, a series of events which were taken very lightly by all concerned. He learned also to conduct conversations in a light and modern style. At least, that was how Flo Bates described them. A style which gave both parties a strong sensation of being deeply meaningful. You see, Flo Bates, you mean exactly what I mean. Well, what do you mean? Ah, oh, now that would be telling. Well, tell me then. Ah, oh, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Mr. Arty Kipps. You are a one for being roundabout. Well, you're not so plain yourself, you know. Not so plain? No. Are you saying that I'm roundabout? I wouldn't dare. You're quite slim. And you ain't plain at all. You're pretty. There. Oh, get out. No, really. I say. What? Where did you get that ring on your finger? Wouldn't you like to know? I dare say I could guess. I've seen you chatting to the under manager. I'm not pulling. I could guess it in three. You couldn't? Not the name. Ah. Ah. But despite this rather enjoyable flirtation with Flo, a vague dissatisfaction with life drifted round Kipps and every now and then enveloped him like a sea fog. He felt great bogs of ignorance about him. <sighs> there must be more to life than walking outside a lady on the pavement, Mr. Wells. Isn't there something else? Like what? Like knowledge. Real ladies and gentlemen, they got knowledge. They know things. There's a girl in memory what can speak French and German. She taught me a bit. Parlez-vous Francie. Well done. You know, I've forgotten all my rivers of England, what I learned at school. But I've got to do something. I suppose some such phase of discontent is a normal thing in every young man. The ripening mind seeks something upon which its will may crystallise, upon which its discursive emotions, growing more abundant with each year of life, may concentrate. But I don't know what you're on about. In that case, I think a little visit to the Folkestone Young Men's Association is in order. You see, my friends, before you, a very sound example of that which I've been propounding to you. A man who has benefited enormously from self-help. A man of semi-independent means who has the good fortune to inherit a part chair in a housing agency, but who has not rested upon such laurels. Oh, no. I have read Mrs. Humphrey Ward. I take an interest in social work. I sit at the last count upon 13 committees. I'm happiest when I can be useful upon social occasions, and such, I trust, has been my function here today. Thank you very much indeed, my friend. May I thank you all for listening so carefully to my little paper on self-help. Self-help is, is by far the noblest of all our distinctive English characteristics. And since talking about it is as thirsty work as listening, I suggest we all adjourn and help ourselves <laughs> to some tea and sandwiches in the other room. Please, thank you very much. Ah, good evening. Haven't seen you here before. No, it's my first visit. Delighted. Chester Coote at your service. Kipps. R.E. Kipps. Pleased to meet you. I hope you've enjoyed the evening. Oh, yes. What do you think of my little... Now, that's just it. I must find out how to get a little self-help on my own account. Have you considered the local science and art classes? Not school. No, no. I say, you could come with me to wood carving. Wood carving? Oh, I fancy the sound of that. It's taught by a lady called Miss Walsing. Wood carving? Taught by a girl? <laughs> That's a bit rough. She's all right, my dear fellow. She matriculated at London University, and she can do marvellous things with bits of wood. In no time, Mr Chester Coote, who took a great interest in social work and lived with his sister, had taken Kipps under his wing and had begun to introduce him to higher things. 
to our little class. Mr. Coot will show you around. Miss Walsingham had a pale intellectual face, dark grey eyes, and black hair which she wore over her forehead in an original striking way that she had adapted from a picture by Rossetti in the South Kensington Museum. She dressed in those loose and pleasant forms and those soft-tempered shades that arose in England in the socialistic aesthetic epoch and which remain with us today in those who scorn science fiction and think on higher planes. She was as beautiful as most beautiful people. And this is Emily. How do you do, Mr. Gibbs? And Miss Lomax. A maiden lady of riper years. How do, young man? Uh, yes, come on. I'll show you where you can work. These people came and went with a sense of absolute assurance against an overwhelming background of plaster casts, diagrams and tables, benches, and a blackboard saturated with recondite knowledge. I bet they know etiquette, these people, and eat complicated meals. As the week passed, he was convinced that they held the secrets to art and the higher life. Mr. Coote, yes. do you remember the scandal at last year's Royal Academy <gasps> opening? Oh, yes, Mr. Coote, indeed I do. <laughs> what are they talking about? You feel like an intruder in an altitudinous world? No, just left out. Kip felt even more uncertain after one class when confidences were shared over coffee. On this occasion, Mr. Henry Walsingham, Helen's brother, was present. Mr. Walsingham, when will you be moving to London? When I have taken my final examinations in law, Miss Emily. Oh, Henry is going to become a solicitor, Mr. Gibbs. We are very proud of you. Oh, nonsense, Helen. It's nothing terribly clever. Oh, it sounds clever. But I never took any examinations. Why did you take it to? <laughs> it's more like where it takes you, Mr. Kipps. It's taking me to London, thank goodness. <laughs> and I shall be able to visit you and go to concerts. Yes. Oh, Helen, perhaps you could give a concert yourself one day. I've always wanted to play the banjo. <laughs> I should never be a professional pianist, Emily. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Extraordinary self-confidence shown by the others spurred Kipps to seek an opportunity for some kind of action which would make the others notice him. One day in summer, such an opportunity arose, and Kipps put his fledgling manhood to the test. How are you getting on with your carving, Mr. Kipps? Well, let me see. Uh, oh, now don't jab so hard. Your intersecting circles will be all angular and crooked. That is true. Hold the board in your left hand, like so. Uh, that's right. Oh, Miss Wilson. Now, you do it. Uh, that's very good. Uh, <laughs> Oh, isn't it warm today, Mr. Kipps? I'll just open a window and come back and watch it. Oh, let me do it, Miss Walsingham. Oh, well, thank you. That is most kind. No trouble. Oh, I think it's a bit stuck. Oh, do be careful. No trouble. Perhaps the sash is broken. Oddly, no trouble. One more year to do it. There. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> Oh, I'm tremendously sorry. I didn't think the glass would break like that. Oh, Mr. Kipps, I do believe you've cut your hand. Uh, Emily, do come and help. Oh, why, you've cut your hand, Mr. Kipps. It's all bad. Miss Lomax, could you... Young man, you cut your wrist. It's bleeding. You cut his wrist and it's bleeding. Dreadful. I haven't the slightest idea the glass was going to break like that. You must tie it up. We must tie it up. It ought to be tied up. Oh, me blood's dripping all over the floor, Miss Walsingham. Look, I'll lift it off. Oh, please oh. don't. All right. Uh, me hanky. Now, now, where's me hanky? I should think it's very bad cut to bleed like but, that. Have you got a handkerchief, Mr. Gibbs? I don't know. I managed not to have one. <laughs> not having a cold, I suppose. I didn't think. Oh, dear. More blood. I am sorry. Oh, here, use my handkerchief. Oh, no. You must be careful how you tie it. I've done ambulance classes twice, and I know you bleed one way if it's a vein and another way if it's an artery. <laughs> Which way it is, I... <laughs> Here, I'll bandage it. Just to pull up your cuffs. Lucky I've put on my shirt with good cuffs. Did you see how afraid me others are? I'll hold your hand. Oh. Not hurting you, am I? Not a bit. Oh, we're not experts, I'm afraid. Oh, you're taking a lot of trouble. I'm sorry about the window, but I can't think what I was doing. Of course, it didn't so much the cut at the time, it's the poisoning afterwards. Oh, I'll pay for the window. Oh, the bleeding should stop soon. It's nothing, really. Uh, could you put your finger on the knot, please, Helen? Of course. Yes. Yeah. I'll 
Do you feel now, Mr. Gibbs? Uh, fine. I knew someone once whose arm was mortified and had to be thrown off. Thrown off? Oh, and right off. Oh. There. That should do. It's not too tight. No, you should have watched the wound first. Oh, well. If there's nothing more I can do, I'll return to my car and come back. I'm afraid you won't be able to do much more tonight, Mr. Kipps. I'll try. I don't want to waste any time. A fellow like me has much time to spare. Well, uh, call on me if you need any help. I will, Miss Rossignol. Uh, he's never seen his interesting face, Helen. He's so sweet when he blushes. I think it comes from a natural delicacy. I reckon he's a love with you, Helen. Don't be silly, <laughs> Emily. <laughs> him. He keeps sneaking little looks at you. He simply adores you. He would abandon himself absolutely upon your altar. But my dear, what have I done to deserve it? Well, just that you haven't done anything. I think you'd make a good match. Oh. I'm going over to have a word with him. Oh, Emily. How's the bandage, Mr. Kip? Oh, fine. You did a good job. How will you manage at work tomorrow? Oh, I'll be all right. Hmm. Do you like your job? Not very much. I don't seem to get on with the customers. Ah, well, that's because you're far too sensitive for a job like that. Do you think so? Mm. I feel so ignorant. I get this feeling that education is just passing me by. I think you owe it to yourself to develop your possibilities, Mr. Kipps. There are all sorts of interesting people you could know. Very nice, Mr. Kipps. There's uh, Miss Walsingham now. Isn't Helen the most lovely person in the world? Have a look at her. Oh, yes. Yes. I think she's lovely, too. I really do. So, what are you going to do in the summer? Oh, well, I thought I could improve myself by reading. The trouble is, I ain't got no books. Oh, you could get books from the public library. Could I really? <laughs> Well, Mr. Kipps, that's it. End of class. Well, everyone, thank you all very much. I shall hope to see you all again in the autumn. Uh, Mr. Kipps, shall you stay in Princeton through the summer? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, and I do hope you will come back to the class. Your work is very promising. Oh, I will. I certainly will. You may count on that. Miss Walsing, I'll do anything. Helen. Goodbye, then, Mr. Kipps. Uh, goodbye. Good class, Helen? Very stimulating, yes. We had the most extraordinary drama, Mr. Walsingham. Oh, yes. One of the students cut himself. I have always thought wood carving to be a dangerous sort of occupation. Perhaps you should give it up, Helen. No, it wasn't in the course of the carving. He was being helpful, opening a window for me. Juice careless, then. Just an accident. It could have happened to anyone. Wouldn't have happened to me. When I open a window, I open a window. <gasps> there was lots of blood, wasn't there, Helen? Spikes. Oh, do stop. I'm not fond of blood. It took us minutes to stop the bleeding. Like a fleet of Florence Nightingales we were. <laughs> who is this fellow who has merited so much undeserved attention? He's a draper. Rather young and rather sweet on Helen. What? Don't be cruel, Emily. I'm not cruel. Merely fat. He likes you, and you like him. Is this true? Is this true? Oh, Henry, don't sound like a heavy-handed elder brother. The sooner I pass my examinations and start practising as a proper solicitor, the better. You should be in London, Helen, not stuck away in some silly provincial nowhere with drapers winking at you. Only one draper so far, Henry. Oh, Helen, you shan't move to London. We couldn't manage without you. I don't plan to stay here forever, you know. But it may be years before our fortunes change. Till then, Mother and I will continue with our little lives while Henry makes our fortune in London. Without the prospect of his weekly woodcarving class, the summer seemed very bleak indeed to Kipps. The visits home to his aunt and uncle on his half-holidays also held little delight, since Anne was not there. Perhaps it was something about the bright sunny weather, but discontent, given voice at mealtimes, seemed rife at Shalford's. More ham, Mr. Kidd. Tough, though. Wouldn't mind walking around the sun today. Take the day off, Carl. What? I dare you. Oh, and who's my place? No fear. But I tell you, I ain't going to stay here all my life. Oh, no. What are you going to do, then? Going to politics. Oh, yeah. How about you, Kipps? <laughs> I want to be a Norfer. Oh, yeah. see, see, what I think is, 
these writers can bridge the classes. Yeah. I mean, mm. they're low, but they can climb to where they'll hit buttons. Almost like gentle These here writers are all oh. failed something else. Dickens is. was a labeller of blacking. Uh-huh. Artist who couldn't sell a drawing. Samuel Johnson walked to London without any boots. Why on earth did he do that? His fate must have killed him. Pride. He threw away his only pair of shoes out of pride. It's lucky, these writers. They just happen to hit on something that catches on. Yeah, there you yeah, are. Yeah. Nice, easy life they have of it, though. Right for an hour or so and done for the day. Yeah. More at work in it than you think. Yeah, I think they copy from each other. Yeah, yeah they get the pictures everywhere. Just like royal knee <laughs> pictures. Oh, oh, oh. Mr. Kidd. Yes, Mr. Shawford. Mr. Kidd, some of your tickets have been placed... Upside down in the window. Oh, go and change them, sir. Make sure you do. Oh, God. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Shawford. If I had a penny, I'm blessed if I wouldn't go and chuck myself off the end of the pier. A penny? It's tuppence to go on the pier. Oh, oh much. <laughs> well, I'd best go and do them tickets. I shall go for a walk tonight after work. At least it don't get dark till late. <laughs> Exactly. It's these handles, you know. Uh, they're too low. And when I go to turn, if I don't remember, why, biff, and I'm into something. Oh, a bicycle. Well, you uh, give me a right one, a whole leg. Oh, these little hills in Folkestone are a fair treat. I was backpedalling for all I was worth. Honest. I do believe I'm bleeding. How many trouser legs all torn down? You really ought to be more careful. Holy smoke. You really are a bit chewed up. I say, uh, come to my diggings and I'll sew it up. Of course, I'm entirely to blame. Oh, Lord, there's a copper. Uh, don't get on, I ran you down, will you? Might be a bit awkward for me. It's all right. He's going the other way. Oh, good. Come on, I'm just around the corner. Kip's new friend was a figure with slightly anterior plumpness, progressing buoyantly on knickerbockered legs with quite enormous calves. Legs that, contrasting with Kip's own practice, were even exuberantly turned out at the knees and toes. On his head, he wore a cycling cap, from beneath which protruded straight wisps of dark red hair. Accidents will happen, you know, especially when you get me on a bicycle. You aren't the first I've run down, not by any manner of means. Most men, after a bump like that, would have been spiteful. But you were a fair bit of all right about that policeman. The least I can do is stand you a needle and thread. There isn't many men would have acted as you did. Cool as a cucumber. Ah, A real gentleman. Here we are. Come in. Come in. Make yourself at home. I'll get us a drink. Kipps took in the shabby ensemble of the little room. A round table covered with a torn red cloth, an extinct fire, a number of dusty postcards and memoranda stuck round the mirror, a table littered with papers and cigarette ash. Here we are, then. Whiskey, good old Methuselah, Canadian rye. There we are. Cheers. Cheers. <coughs> nice. Room. Have a good look round. What do you take me to be? I don't know. These photos. <whistles> that lady in tights, that's a bit odd. Is this you? You're in that funny costume? Do you have an actor? Getting warm. Here, read this letter. Dear Mr. Chitterlow, if we'll send the play you spoke of... I can't read the rest. I don't know. What's on them papers? Writing, lots of writing. Those are manuscripts, my dear fellow. Have some more whiskey. Oh, um... Here! Oh, oh, so very much. The truth is, I'm a playwright. Well, I never. Of course, I've been everywhere and done everything, uh, practically. I'm an actor, too, of course. I've acted abroad, you know. Had my name in reviews. Why, I can remember the time I was getting 30 or 40 dollars a week. Really? In America, that was. I've been around the entire civilized world, come to that. You write plays? Well, of course, I'm not quite up to the standard of Shakespeare or Ibsen. I have to be truthful about my talent. A real writer, chappy. You know, it's curious how one runs up against people out bicycling. 
I was just wanting someone to talk to a bit. Half an hour ago, I didn't know you existed. And here we are, talking like old friends. Have a cigarette. Oh, don't mind if I do. This old Bethesda's going into my stomach like a burning torch. <laughs> ah, lovely, isn't it? Some people like soda with their whiskey. I don't. No more do I. That's my man. Here. Oh. You know, you are a fellow of great promise. You're the sort of chap a chap like myself can sit and discourse with. Let me tell you, most of the coves I come across in the course of my theatrical wanderings... No, th that's not ten o'clock, is it? Must be. Don't worry, it's early yet. I'll best be going now. The fact is, Mr. Shulford, that's my boss at the Emporium, he shuts the house door half past ten. Hold on, old chap, hold on. You can't go back with your trouser in that state. Here, I'll sew up the tear. Won't take a minute. You fill up your glass while I get a needle and thread. Well, uh... go on. Take me half a minute. I'm an expert with a needle. Ah, found it. Now... You just put your foot on that chair so as I can see what I'm doing. <laughs> oh, my heavens! Wouldn't this just make a bit of business in a farcical comedy? <laughs> Actually, it reminds me of the first scene I've written in a little play of mine. <laughs> this will make you laugh. It's a man. Wait for it, wait for it. A man with a live beetle down the back of his neck. <laughs> trying to seem at ease in a room full of people. Yes, it sounds good. <laughs> oh, sorry, old chap. Oh, it makes me shake just thinking of it. It's a killer, that scene, I tell you. Sounds damn, damn fine, Chitlow. Damn fine. May I say, in all frankness, that I have never met a finer intelligence than yours. Stronger there might be. That I couldn't say with certainty yet, seeing how little, after all, we have seen of each other. But a finer, why never? It really is a shame that such a fine, and not to say discriminating intelligence should be nightly locked up at ten. Ten-thirty, and... Uh, they won't lock you up. 